Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to be covering the topic of genetic control in biomedical ethics. We're using the chapter three of intervention and reflection textbook as our basis. Specifically, we're focused on the briefing session and the articles by McMahon and Steinbach. So what exactly do we mean by genetic control? Genetic control refers to the idea of using invasive processes in order to make a preferential selection in the kinds of organisms that we want around. We can select for certain traits or we can select against traits. The invasive aspect refers to interference with the natural process and includes everything from selective abortions to gene editing. What do we mean by preference in the term preferential selection? Well, that's where the rubber meets the road on this question. For majority of issues, we're concerned with things like preventing genetic disease and using genetic therapy to solve problems. But the issue of eugenics immediately rears its head, so the issue can be rather thorny. The idea is that with the increasing technological ability to detect, modify, and correct varieties of genetic problems, we are increasingly able to interfere in the natural process of biological life at the core genetic level and create better results. Now these are considered better because genetic deformities lead to added hardships, inability to live an otherwise normal life, participate in society at a normal level, etc. Now because we're trying to understand the issue here, we can't shrink away from using direct terms. Like, there is no point in resorting to euphemisms. Spina bifida does not make you differently abled. It essentially prevents you from functioning outside of 24-7 medical care and without the whole host of latest and greatest medical advances. It's not a net benefit to the person suffering or to society. Now that sounds harsh, I know, but think of it this way. We're already engaged in fixing the problem the best we can. If you gave doctors, parents, or the patient the ability to wave a magic wand and get rid of spina bifida, would they take it? Of course they would. Thus, everyone already recognizes the fact that there is a problem, and that normalcy is what they aim for. All the soft language in the world doesn't serve to fix the problem. In fact, especially here, when dealing with biomedical ethics, it actively gets in the way of recognizing the scope and severity of the issue. And if our understanding of the issue isn't complete, then we're much more likely to have a misconception and come to false conclusions. Frankly, if I could have skipped the 18 reconstructive surgeries I went through, I would have. And so would every other kid I met at that hospital. And that was the best possible environment for resolving these issues. Now, if every person in the best place would have rather avoided it, then just imagine the situation in all the other places. Finally, and though this should really be common sense, when we're talking about genetic deformities, we're talking about functional values, not moral values. And for a whole article on that difference, there's a link in the description. Responsibility. When we deal with genetic control, we're faced with a very uncomfortable issue of responsibility. There is parental responsibility, patient responsibility, medical responsibility, and social responsibility. Parents will be responsible for the child over the first 18 years of their life. And that means that, depending on the problem, the parents will have the additional burden of caring for the child beyond the standard. They are responsible for the costs, the treatment, the time, the effort, and so on. Now, depending on the problem, it may be necessary to provide around-the-clock care, which for most people means that one parent can't work, at least for a while. In severe cases, the responsibility is to care for someone for the rest of your life. For cases where the child can reach adulthood and function independently as an adult, the patient will be responsible for the additional care, costs, treatment, and so on. That comes with the problem. Even an increased chance of cancer means that the patient is now more susceptible to a serious risk than is necessary, strictly speaking. On the medical side, there is a responsibility to perform tests, to counsel patients. Often enough, this is all about giving bad news and then worse news. If you've never been faced with such problems, you probably don't have any sense of what it means to have to deal with them. You likely don't understand the scope of responsibility, of financial costs, and of the effort required. The medical responsibility is also to try to impart all of this knowledge to people as a result of the ability to screen. And this counseling takes on different forms depending on when the screening is done and what the resulting options are. 
Finally, there is a social responsibility. On the one hand, there is the responsibility to make screenings and possibly the solutions easily available. On the other hand, there is a responsibility to offer assistance to parents and patients in order to minimize the negative impacts on these members of society. But then, there is the uglier side of things. Since the society does take on the responsibility of taking care of people who need help, does it also not have a responsibility to minimize the number of such people, so that the available funds are able to cover the needs of all of those who need it, and to be used for other social goods? In case of several countries like Iceland, there is a social push to reduce Down syndrome through voluntary screenings and selective abortion. Though voluntary, nearly 100% of detected fetuses with Down syndrome are aborted. Now what does it mean to have a responsibility to reduce the number of people born with defects? What kind of intervention, if any, might be justified? How do we define defects? Would a biracial child in a severely racist society be considered disabled? What about any other external features that are, in effect, purely cosmetic? What about the shape of one's nose? What about the probability of heart disease? Where exactly do we draw the line? As a historical note, we should also be reminded that up until very recently, people across the planet were forced to give up for dead any children who were born with kinds of deformities that are routinely resolved these days. In Greece, for example, Children with deformities like cleft lip and palate were thrown into wells, and that's in Athens, not in Sparta. While it seems inhumane, we need to understand that the alternative was to have the child suffer until it died, within a few days, months, or perhaps years later. And that's because there was no way of fixing the issue, and the issue was severe enough to kill you. This is important because it means that the question before us has been faced by humanity across millennia though we seem to be the first ones who can actually do something about it. A great movie on this subject, by the way, is Gattaca. Yes, the name of the movie is a genetic sequence. It stars Ethan Hawke and Uma Thurman, and it is literally on, on this idea of uh, genetic modification, and I highly recommend it. So let's look at the ethical theories on these issues. Number one, utilitarianism. Since the goal is maximizing happiness and minimizing suffering, a technique that detects, modifies, and corrects the kinds of genetic problems seems geared towards the utilitarian goal. At the very least, utilitarians seem rather willing to pursue this line of thought since the pleasure and pain of a fetus are significantly less than those of adults. The difference between simply ceasing to be and watching your world fall apart around you when you're aware of the world. And this is certainly not limited just to selective abortions. In utero, corrective surgeries presumably cause pain to the fetus, but that pain is completely forgotten by the time it is born, so better to do it then than later. Since utilitarians are aimed at a world with minimized suffering, and since genetic control can reduce at least some forms of suffering, it seems rather obvious that such steps should be taken. Kantian, or deontic ethics, is a bit trickier. Since consequences are not in play and neither is context, the move has to be justified by a universal maxim and without contradiction. Since there is no hierarchy of values in Kantian ethics, it means that the right to life, which the ontic ethics have but utilitarianism doesn't, must be absolute and universal, so that any genetic deformities cannot even be taken into account. Similarly, improvement by intrusion, if allowed, would seem to have no limits. On the other hand, the idea that you can't make decisions based on preferences and presence or absence of disability could be seen as preference would then seem to prohibit the entire venture. And then we have the second imperative, treating people as ends in themselves. Since no one seems to aim at being disabled and we aim at fixing disabilities, then one ought to work with the fetus for its ends, namely the removal of disability. Now if this all seems contradictory, it's because it is. All this comes from the fact that we can't rank order these values. So what we have is an unclear solution because actions are arranged in a way to prevent anything like a meaningful resolution. Here are the results. It seems that we can make a decent argument that we can intervene in genetic therapy, surgeries and so on, because we're working with the interests of the fetus, that's our future patient. We would also be working with the interests of the parents, the medical community and society. However, one could not perform a selective abortion on these grounds. 
because the interests of the fetus are removed and they are treated as mere means. Rawlsian ethics would, from what I can understand, find the whole procedure acceptable, beginning to end. It seems this way because no one would voluntarily choose to have a disability in the original contract under the veil of ignorance. At the same time, it would suggest that the treatment of disabled people should not be in any way compromised. That is, their rights should be fully recognized and respected by society. One thing to note here is that by the Rawlsian setup, it may be argued that the detection, modification, and correction should be imposed on the populace. Since society has a lot of problems to deal with anyway, needlessly taking up resources would be seen as something that cannot be rationally supported. It's one thing to have a test fail and to have a disabled child, along with all the costs and responsibility that confers on everyone, but it is an entirely different thing to, in effect, intentionally have a disabled child, and then force the consequences onto the rest of society. Thus, it may be arguable that the freedom of choice can, in this case, be supplanted by the rights of society. Ross's ethics don't really seem to resolve any part of the issue for us. It could be argued that the actual obligation is to engage in detection, modification, and correction, or not to. The problem here is the issue of intuition, which seems to vary. That said, I think a stronger argument can be made in favor of genetic control. Why? Because the rational means of arriving at conclusions would indicate that, since people don't seem to want to be disabled, then the ability to interfere can be taken as a right to interfere in order to provide that benefit. Finally, the natural law ethics is a bit of a mess here. And this is because even though natural law is aiming at universality, there is no natural analog to the issue. Nothing else has the ability to intervene in the genetic process. On the other hand, we can argue that intervention, possibly with the exception of natural selection, is justified. Since we're supposed to be making judgments by reason and by your own experience, we find that even animals will attempt to help their young before leaving them for dead. That is, they do whatever is in their power to provide help first. If we extend that, we can argue that the ways in which we can help are merely more complex and that the same principle of helping to the best of our ability should be used. Then again, that seems like an argument that may be made from desire, and desires throw us off from rational thinking. Perhaps the correct approach, the natural one, if you will, is to simply let the chips fall where they will. Now, I personally have a bit of a problem with this last argument, which is commonly pitched as, it's in God's hands, or let God decide. The problem is that we don't do this except for these messy cases. Like, if you get sick, you don't say, God will decide. You go to a doctor. If you break your arm, you don't leave it in God's hands. You go and get a cast. But now that the issue is messy, now is the time to leave it in God's hands? That seems like a pretty bad cop-out. On to the articles themselves. McMahon provides us with four arguments against screening for disability. The first one is that the practice is discriminatory with the aim of ridding the world of people of a certain type. Two, the practice may be detrimental to individual disabled people by labeling them as socially undesirable. Three, reduction in disability may lead to reduction in human diversity and their unique contributions. And four, screening and selection is a practice that is hurtful to existing disabled people because it argues that being disabled is bad or that being disabled is worse than having a lack of disability. Now, McMahon uses a very nicely convoluted example to arrive at the following conclusion. If it is morally mandatory to allow oneself to have a disabled child rather than try through screening to have a child who would not be disabled, then it must be at least permissible to cause oneself to have a disabled child rather than a non-disabled child. The point here is that if we take the above objection seriously, then there would be nothing wrong but intentionally causing disability in your children, provided that you didn't break any laws in doing so. So let's imagine a woman who just found out that she's pregnant. She goes out to a bar every night with her significant other, and they make sure that she drinks at the point of blackout. And they do this because they want the child, but they want their child to be born with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. 
and they want that because they already had one, quote, normal child and want to see how different the parental experience would be with a child who had fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Now, I'm pretty sure I'm speaking for everyone when I say that such behavior would be seen as morally monstrous. Yet, if we follow McMahon's argument, then there is nothing that we could do or should do about it. In fact, we don't even have a right to voice our dissent. The line of argument that claims that it's no worse off to be disabled than not to be would have to fully accept the conclusions above. If there is no difference, then there is no argument to be made for somehow harming the fetus or causing harm down the line. And that's because if the two are the same, then making one into the other cannot be beneficial or harmful in any way, especially in terms of embryo and fetus selection. Now, if we're not happy with that conclusion, then we have to challenge the premises, namely the idea that there is no difference between ability and disability. That, however, means that screening should be understood as morally mandatory, and from the idea of screening, any early intervention would be acceptable, with the possible exception of abortion, and then the severity of disability would likely come into play. This position is in line with utilitarian, Rawlsian, and Ross's ethics. It may be in conflict with the natural law theory, though the fact that we try to fix any such genetic defects after the fact might indicate otherwise. As for Kantian ethics, since the argument here depends on the hierarchical ordering of obligations, it would be rejected entirely. That said, allowing the natural process to take place, not intervening out of preference, is likely an entirely different thing than forcing a specific outcome, injecting one's preference into the outcome. And so that would be governed by two different maxims. A thing to note is that McMahon's position is carefully sticking to the functional values rather than moral values in this examination. That same link in the description. Now, he can pull some moral ideas out of functionality, but his argument doesn't cross into the moral evaluation of disability. Our second article is Genetics and Abortion by Steinbach. Steinbach gives us an interesting article on the use of screening with the intention to select, that is, abort, fetuses with disabilities. She begins with a presentation of two arguments against screening. Argument one is forms of variation that contends that disabilities are a form of human variation and should be affirmed the same way that other variation is affirmed, like being female or being black. Argument two is a disability perspective on abortion argument, which contends that selection on the basis of disability is no different than on the basis of gender. And if aborting female fetuses because of their female nature is wrong, so the abortion of disabled fetuses for their disabled nature must be just as wrong. Now these two arguments are separate and separate from the general pro-life, pro-choice positions. In fact, our author notes, some of the most passionate disability advocates are pro-choice, and some of the most ardent pro-life supporters see extreme disability as justifying abortion on the same kinds of grounds as rape and incest generally do. This is an interesting intersection of ideas because their confluence leads to some odd conclusions. Ash, for example, argues that while abortion is fine in case one does not want the child, it is not fine if one does not want to have a disabled child. That is, if the fact of disability is the reason for desiring an abortion, it is only then that abortion becomes morally wrong, and the same kind of wrong as having an abortion because the child is not of a preferred gender. Anas, on the other hand, argues that the use of prenatal testing to weed out fetuses whose lives would not be worth living, um, i.e. they would be better off not being born, is justified. But Steinbach notes that this is actually rarely the case. The majority of screenings indicate far less extreme genetic deformities, so the arguments made by Anas, even if correct, are actually severely limited. Steinbach is instead interested in the rest of the cases where deformity can be detected and life is still worth living. On a side note, I personally find it interesting to see these life worth living arguments. Having spent quite a bit of time around kids with incredibly debilitating problems, I have yet to meet one who exhibits that life not worth living attitude. Now part of that may be because there are two very different perspectives in play here. When you're born with a disability, that is the normal. But if you were to acquire that disability down the line, 
your normal would be lost and this new suckier reality would be the thing you're left with. So perhaps if we view it from that perspective, the idea of becoming disabled rather than simply being disabled is what accounts for this difference in argument and reality. That said, I haven't had a chance to deal with such examples in cases of extreme poverty and prejudice, so that could also play part in the argument. So Steinbach argues for seeing the screening and abortion as prevention. So screenings and abortion work as a way for prospective parents to prevent an outcome they reasonably want to avoid, the birth of a child who can be sick, I assume here that she means uh, chronically sick, or have a serious disability. Now the exact nature of the argument she can make depends on the status of the fetus, does it have human rights or not. Since she's following Ash's argument, she's going to go off the pro-choice option. So keeping people healthy is a moral good. Development of a disability is the opposite of keeping people healthy. But it is not permissible to reduce the development of disabilities by killing disabled people. So if we assume that fetuses have full human rights, then we can't have an abortion on the grounds of preventing disability because that would be killing disabled people. But if fetuses or embryos are not people, which is Ash's position, then we can have abortions to prevent disabilities, because what we are killing is not people. The counter-argument by Ash is that abortion, as a result of disability screening, is just a discriminatory position, because what's at stake is our inability to welcome and accept a life that has characteristics that are perceived as defects and impairments. So Steinbach has a series of replies here. First, calling it perceived misses the point or if we want to be less charitable, it maliciously misrepresents the point. Minimizing the physical, mental, and emotional burdens of parenting a child with disabilities is actively harmful to everyone. The cost of caring for a disabled child can be astronomical, and to clarify, we're not talking just about financial costs. Additionally, from the pro-choice perspective that Ash is coming from, the decision to terminate a pregnancy is based on wanting to avoid burdens that come with being a mother, burdens that the mother finds unacceptable. Now, those burdens are only exacerbated by disability. Hence, the distinction that Ash is trying to draw here is less than functional. Second, Steinbach says, the fact that a child may become disabled later on does not provide much of an argument against screening and selective abortion. From the prevention perspective, the fact that preventative measures may not be successful is no reason not to try those that have a decent chance of working. On top of that, on the pro-choice view, the obligations a parent may incur with an actual child born, should the child become disabled, are unrelated to any obligations the same parent has to a fetus because the fetus has none of the rights of a child. Steinbach finally concludes that the charge of discrimination is a weak one. The fact that we would prefer a child without disabilities does not mean that we value people with disabilities any less. In fact, it doesn't mean that we would value a child with disabilities less, if that is what we got. If that were the case, then taking prenatal vitamins, including folic acid, which reduces the risk of spina bifida, would be a discriminatory act. So let's take a slightly deeper look here. Steinbach's discrimination argument ties back to the McMahon article. Unless you're arguing that there is no difference between abled and disabled, then the discrimination charge just doesn't work. But if you are arguing that, then the intentional introduction of a disability, any disability, should be understood as perfectly moral. And that means that if we map the argument out, it's not abortion that's the problem. It's the idea that one would do anything to fix the situation. But at that rate, in utero procedures to correct the disability would be equally problematic, and so would any treatment after the birth. And this is because they both point to the idea of disability being something not desirable, something we want to rectify. Now, as a way of expanding on Steinbach's idea of costs, imagine a mother of three who, in her fourth pregnancy, discovers that the child will be severely disabled. And by severely, I mean 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year kind of care for the rest of that kid's life. Now, if that was the first child, the cost would be astronomical. But as the fourth child, 
it means that the other three children, let's assume that they're aged four, three, and two, are going to effectively lose their mother. That's the level of care that will be required. And that's without taking into account any financial costs to be borne by the whole family. Most likely the inability to go to college, because unless you have a seven-figure salary, managing those costs is going to be next to impossible without going into bankruptcy. So the most likely scenario is that the family is financially ruined, the other children effectively lose their mother, and then society has to step in and bear those costs. And bearing those costs means not using those resources to help a lot of other people instead. Now this is cold calculation, but there is only so much resources to go around. For myself, the last 11 surgeries cost $165,000 just for the bed at the hospital. Just the bed. Not the food, not the medicine, not the actual surgeries, just the bed. The total costs were well in excess of a million dollars, and my disability was incredibly light compared to the more serious cases like spina bifida, and my treatment was actually concluded, and the issue was resolved. Now imagine someone whose treatment never ends, whose every activity, including sitting, has significant additional costs. Now imagine how many other people with much lighter issues could have been helped with the same social resources. Imagine how many people around the world could have been lifted out of poverty with the resources used to fix one life, and in many cases not even fix, just sort of maintain at tolerable levels. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not arguing for turning children into an investment calculation. In fact, if it wasn't for the extreme charity of others, I would be in a very different boat. But there is something to be said for taking reasonable factors into account. To simply boil this down into an issue of discrimination is, from my perspective, to maliciously misrepresent the reality of costs associated with the consequences of such decisions. To say nothing of misrepresenting the perspective of parents who are presented as having taken this route because they are bigoted. As a final thought, I want you to consider the following issue. Anencephaly is a genetic defect that is detectable during pregnancy, but which is not treatable and which always results in death shortly after birth. CDC link in the description. And that means that if the mother does not abort it, she will carry the fetus to term, go through birth, and then watch her child pass away in days if not hours. And there is nothing at all to be done. Nothing. Now, if we take the discrimination line as presented by McMahon or Steinbach, then aborting such a fetus is only done because of the discrimination and bigotry of the parents, and it is detrimental to the disabled community at large. But is that really a functional position? Could it not be that the various costs, including severe psychological costs of carrying a child to term, only to watch it die immediately, might actually play a part here? Is it bigoted for parents to wish to avoid the psychological trauma by screening and selective abortion? Of course, some cases of screening and selective abortion might involve discrimination. But there are enough other non-discriminatory reasons that the attempt to reduce at all the discrimination seems incredibly malicious. Beyond that, it also seems to imply that the fact that we might have a preference of any kind in this case, preference for the direction of our lives or preference for the lives of our children, is inherently discriminatory and bigoted. How so? Well, if you would so much as prefer to have the kind of life that does not involve caring for a disabled person, it means that you are bigoted against disabled people. If you would prefer not demand that your child play sports, then you're bigoted against disabled people at least with the kinds of disabilities that prevent such activities. Again, this is based on the mere existence of a preference. Now, I hope that this chapter has allowed you to see into the kinds of nuanced problems that arise out of what might otherwise seem like a really straightforward issue. We didn't get to the problem of aesthetic preferences in genetic control, primarily because that conversation will take a good long while. But again, go watch Gattaca for some interesting ideas, and it's a great movie. If you have comments or questions, uh, you can leave them down below or you can email me.